presentation of this panel. So Ian will be sharing with us uh, some reflections on federated structures for cooperatives. And, uh, and Ian is a professor emeritus at the University of Victoria. And I would say this, and he's not allowed to say no, that he is Canada's foremost cooperative historian. So we're very lucky to be here. Actually, I've been running to be supreme dictator of the world. <laughs> The only thing I'm going to do is have a beautiful one kind of computer, no changes for 10 years. And I have a huge, huge support base. Push that back. Hmm? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. So let's welcome Ian. Yeah. I, uh, the topic that I'm involved with, the National Project, is on federations. And with a particular focus on health and on rural cooperatives and the possibilities of national federations. I'm not going to talk very much about the last two things uh, because I've done some work that I'm not very happy with again, and I have a lot of interviewing and talking with people that I want to do. But I will mention a few things. Mostly I want to talk about the issue of federations. I don't know how many times I've heard the emphasis on cooperative difference here in the last day and a half. It seems to come up all the time. Here's one. And we overlook it. We don't think about the federated structures that we create and how they contribute and how they differentiate. I mean, we automatically seem to uh, either reject it or apply it, the head office mentality to a federation. And that's not the nature of the relationship with any federations. I don't know really anyway. So anyway, I'll elaborate this a bit more. What I'm trying to do is to think about the uh, importance of nature and the distinguishing features of cooperative federations. And there are certain basic general issues that come up at the end. Again, I'm going to be giving points that I'm sure are already in your mind, but I think it's important to dwell on a little bit. And then understand the specific aspects and issues that confront new federations or federations that are being formed. Now there's another kind of issue buried in this, and it's broader than just the federations issue. It is that we, we, we tend to want to make cooperatives finite boxes from where they are today, and not look back and see that they didn't fit those boxes. And in fact, they weren't even in boxes for a long time. The, the problem comes from the fact that we, for various good reasons, the co-op movement, we, we had to insist on corporate structures that were registered. And that means we've underemphasized. Or we have under-examined the informal structures that go along with them and the support of federations. So there is a specific focus, and I will say a few words about that. Why are they important? Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I'm sure you need to know these will immediately come to your mind. But this is the way in which co-ops build from local strengths, the most common way that they build. And it, it goes back incredibly far in the co-op history in the 1850s. <coughs> if you want to take the Rochdale, uh, forget about Sussex, take the Rochdale, uh, the Rochdale approach, within 10 years, people working in or contributing to cooperative institutions formed a federation. And they were thinking in very large terms. It's amazing. And they ultimately created organization. Eliminate middlemen. If it's in a marketing situation, find ways to market more effectively. Undertake steady or, or stay healthy situations. And this is really important in certain kinds of cooperatives uh, where the federations assist in that. And most particularly maybe some of the more recent kinds of federations. Lobbying, providing services, accumulate assets, and it's accumulated in different ways. And this is why um, some of the strength of the co-op world is not fully realized. One of the things is that some federated structures don't fully document their assets. There's no great need for them to say, oh, well, how big they are. They may not want to say, how big they are. And they're usually understated in the balance sheets, which is why they're often so nice to take over. Outside people get a chance. For your opportunities. Um, you should never underestimate the ambitions of people working in co-ops or elected people in co-ops. Or think about where they fit in. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this. 
I'm sure there are people in this room who've heard this a dozen times, right? But I will continue. <laughs> I believe in the notion of cooperative stewardship. I don't like the word. It has Christian overtones that I don't think are appropriate in a global context, but it's the best word. And I believe in the, in the values and principles cooperatives have to pay special attention to five different areas. I think that you would add something. These are the five main ones. And what that means is that a cooperative cannot ignore membership, which is very common, until suddenly they have a crisis. It means they cannot forget their community impacts. Well, they may want to think what they mean by community. They cannot ignore the state, and many cooperatives are atrocious in their recognition of the political side. They cannot, afford, they cannot ignore the sector and the efforts and kind of this organization we're talking, thinking about today, this is a key part of the sector. So it's, and then you have managing, which is a special kind of managing. It's a managing that, for example, takes a very different approach to members, community, state, and sector. Uh, I could go on, but I won't. Uh, now you can apply this concept to a local co-op or you can apply it to a federation. And you have to say, what are they doing? I find this a very useful little blueprint to think about. And then the other thing that's important to understand for me is that cooperatives, I don't like life cycle because I know what happens at the end of a life cycle. <laughs> and I have no intention of predicting that. And there's no reason some of the oldest organizations in the world are cooperatives. Uh, formative, stabilizing, building, re-examining, and reformulating. That's what's left of my grade 12 algebra. To repeat it. Right? Re-examining, reformulating. Which is the ongoing process. Now each stage, each stage has different means and different requirements for membership, for community, for state, etc. They change. So if a federation comes along and it's and it's really working for cooperatives in the formative stage and it's in the formative stage, there's where some complexities emerge. So I won't go on any further. I hope it might be interesting. And the federations, though, is an important dimension of how these how cooperatives function. And uh, it's a part of their identity. Now, when I was thinking about that, I, I came up with this idea that we carry with us a bias toward the local. This is going to make me sound like I'm something just as close as to the crack. I know. The point is, we do. We like the local. You know, mom and dad got together with the neighbors and they organized the child care co op. We like the local. It's, 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 it's the romantic side of the cooperative world, and it's great. However, by emphasizing the local, think about what we say to people. Right? It's always that. In my mind, uh, you tell them what they can do locally. Um, okay, the bias toward the local is the primary frame of reference for most people. It's uh, it, co-ops tend to start as a way of meeting individual and community needs. That's the point, and that's how we sell them. If you want to be crass, uh, and I think we've got to rethink that. It's an effective way to meet quickly many social and economic needs. The local is easy to understand, or you think it is. The accountability is simple, and when you get a larger federation, and you've got all kinds of complex relationships within there and skills. You know, my gosh, you're going to hire accountants and people out of all kinds of programs to, to run these things. And, and it gets very difficult. And I, I know in my own experience, a lot of people are suspicious of central institutions because they don't understand. Okay. That's your first defense. So I think it's a, it's a double barrel thing. The local is, is powerful because it gives us a promise and it's often the reality of the problem. And it, it, it practices, it's an opportunity to practice my friend Jack Bates used to emphasize so much, um, direct democracy. You know, the, uh, the Athenian notion of democracy. We have a problem, let's call a meeting, let's get together and we'll all have a vote and we'll, we'll resolve it. Well, when you get tears, when you get all kinds of complexities, it's not so easy. And the advertising and promotion of local co-ops is the norm. Think about it. Now there are exceptions. Deja that is very good. Cooperators is getting better in the YCA. But I would say they're the exceptions. We don't talk, we don't project the idea of, of, uh, of, of the enormity.
reality and the possibility of the system and what the tears, if you like, provide. And so we have interests of local leaders and an understandable human situation is people become involved in a local co-op and it's my co-op and I'm going to protect my co-op and <coughs> your hands off my co-op. I don't care what the whole civil wants to do. Well, that's, that's the bias towards the local, I said that already. It's not a result of literature, by the way. I don't want this to be thought of. I mean, people like Rex Fairburn and others who have written about uh, central organizations, I think we've done a pretty good job. But I don't know how to tell, say this in a nice way, so I won't try. But I'm not sure too many people read what has been written about the history of development of co-ops. Especially people in co-ops. I mean, they like to have them on the shelf, but how much they read. <laughs> Now that sounds like a knowing laugh from Paul for that. <laughs> but it's not the result of the literature. Because the literature is stronger than, than, than it might be. But there is a problem with literature in that it tends to be very descriptive and, and often issues left there. It's are complicated to deal with. But rather, it's a consequence of practice and being in a nasty mood. Arguably, insufficient reflection generally within the movement about what it's about. If you thought more about it, you'd realize, you know, the, the, the value of thinking of the tears. The music of the tears, I thought that was <laughs> The music of the tears in the go-op world, it ranges from harmony to discordance. Sometimes it works to the other. The other 80% of the time, there's discordance. <laughs> and it's for good reason. It's not there. I have friends who can't believe the cooperators quite think. I always say, why not? They're talking about their food, their work, their housing. Why not? They should be you know, involved, and sometimes that means this works. But anyway, in this, when you look at the issues in the tiers in, in networks and feder in federations, in the federations, decisions on core objectives are always difficult. Setting membership rules is a perennial. Uh, selecting from the long list of possible activities, I believe that cooperative organizations are when they are left to go, they're given scope, are very entrepreneurial. So on a local or a, a federated level, there are always possible activities cut inside. Voting entitlements, I think I lived through three rounds of this with DC Credit Union. The funding formula that apply. The process they use to make decisions. Finding leadership is a, is, is a real problem. And Another perennial, when you undertake a new activity, where do you do it? At the local or the federated level? Why? And those are always, if you look at the credit union industry, you see this constantly. Right. So, given such complexities and despite the benefits, why federations are all over this country is. I wish I didn't have to. Do that. I think it's implicit. Federations and the structures that are associated with are implicit in cooperative law, which is uh, an under-considered uh, dimension of cooperation. And uh, the whole lot can be said there. Social movement solidarity, a lot of cooperative organizations come from, or are associated with, with uh, social movements, and they often bring a kind of uh, a perspective that draws you out of communities, single local communities, and other Economic opportunity is another major source. A crucial one, and this is especially true of the, the two uh, net, uh, federation ideas that are really at the end of this process, are government relations and state. You go back to the list of five things. That's, uh, from a federated perspective, that state relationship is frequently fundamental. Public relations and information, I won't dwell on that. Cooperative water partnership, I've made, made, made it, and then there's ambition. Ambition occurs in terms. And as management sends elected leaders, it affects how federations are developed and where they go and how they have to deal with issues. So, given the variety of contexts and the multiplicity of sources, there's no single way in which federations or alliances develop. And, you know, that sounds like a nice truck statement, but it's important to remember because many people use as a measuring stick the federations that are now well established. Well, you're not like federated, you're not like co-op Atlantic, are you sure you're okay? 
uh, that kind of thing. And in fact, the federations are going to be quite variable, depending on what they're in. Like, that's a problem. Unless you want to only have one box. And, and the variations go on. I just mentioned a number of them. They're very obvious to me. When I look at some of the federations, you know, the, the one that always comes up is availability of funds, but I'm not so sure that's the key, the most important one. The other thing is, is to realize what I was trying to suggest earlier when you talk about federations. The, uh, um, you shouldn't try to understand the past by what you think the present should be. In other words, the institutions that emerge now, there are all kinds of ways. In the credit union world, for example, alliances are probably, and there's, there's a question here, alliances are probably more important than federations. Our credit unions function together with alliances, and I think other places too. But why is that important? The federation idea has an inclusive dimension to it. Alliances don't. We ally, sorry, you know, that kind of thing, and it happens all the time. And so the, 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 the inclusive dimension of cooperation is going to be lost. But alliances have many other advantages. We can go and have lunch and make our decision. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I, I, you know, as I think about this, I find five prominent patterns. I have been visiting models, but that's not right. And I coined a new word, hubness. You probably haven't heard that before. <laughs> The drive to hubness, the idea that the central organization becomes the powerful force. There are many pressing examples of that. And uh, the British is, is maybe the most obvious one, but there are many others. Where organizations, federations are created, and the idea is that gradually over time, the local organizations and the local membership are less important. The pyramid has been. And that's uh, a, uh, and the British example is really interesting because there's a whole kind of justification for it that's fascinating, it's lost in time, but uh, it's left the British with the system. But they had to reform dramatic, dramatically in the 1980s and 1990s, and you know, they made significant, uh, significant strides. And it's emulated in several European consumer movements. The hub, the federation, is where the action is. You could probably think about it. But that's not. The federated trends in community-based financial profit. I think they're a little different, maybe because I spent more time on these. But it's it's quite a different system in the financial cooperatives. I think it has to do with the nature of their business, the nature of the relationships between the, the tiers, uh, the nature of the financial markets, and uh, so you have. It's kind of a hub, but. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, it varies considerably. And one of the hardest jobs I ever had was, I don't, I don't remember, this is terrible, I don't remember what the country was in Africa. But someone there who had experienced both Desjardins and CCA development asked me, why are they so different? They are uh, in terms of their development. And their structures are different, and there's historical reasons for that, and all kinds of reasons for it. But the federated, the community-based financial cooperatives, I, I think, are, are uh, need to be looked at independently because of the underlying issues around, uh, around uh, responsibility, uh, the management of money. I think it's a different, a different world. The prominent patterns, the third, how did I get the fourth? Because I didn't count for um, federations with charismatic beginning. This is weird, but I can't think of another way of putting it. These are cooperative federations that began because there was a charismatic. And there he is. There's Aaron Sapiro. He doesn't look that bad. But he was. And out of, him came, out of his work came Sunkiss, Sunmaid, Welch's. You probably this morning had something in care of Aaron Sapiro. Um, and um, in, the United, in Canada, that became too important to the wheat pools, the dairy pools that were created, and I'm being pulled off the stage. In them, there's a central importance of education and information. 
And implicit in this approach is uh, a, sometimes, ahead often, a questionable co-op commitment. Amazing how quickly the pools move away. Yeah. Oh, that's where I got it. Accumulation of local co-ops. This is the most common way, and it's, it's the one that's least examined because we judge by present success going back, and many of these don't work out too well, or they remain so small, so narrow, that they don't have a whole lot of it. But the common beginnings for worker co-ops, some forms of agricultural co-ops, health co-ops, which are local, are interesting in particular. So I think the problems they have come out of this particular pattern. And the struggles are over delegated responsibilities, who takes accountability for what. And there are complexities that are almost inevitable with this existing and established co-ops. Uh, they're very concerned about government relations. Uh, they usually are involving co-ops in their formative and stabilizing phases, which is important, I think, for whatever one wants to conclude about health co-ops and, and the new forms of agriculture. And there's always an unfair comparison for those established federations. The National Federations, I know this is a CC event, but I won't say anything more because it's, it's a special kind of kind of federation. And I, I think uh, they, they, they do blend a little bit. But anyway, it's, there are uh, uh, characteristics of those federations. There. So on the conclusions, creating federations, uh, is, it's ingrained in the co-op movement. There are many reasons why co-op federations are formed. The purposes and modes of organization are very considerable. And underlying much of it is the significant government policies and administrative systems the state. Okay, agricultural rural co-op federations, 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> uh, the remarkable variations around the world. Uh, incredibly interesting history, it really is, because there's so much benefit. And it's embedded in agricultural policy, which is as a, as a field of interest, if you have such a perverted set of interests, is, is a fascinating thing, how it changes, how we went from, uh, I won't get uh, Comparative, Latin, in Canada, we're, we're, uh, we're um, different because we have a, a lack of national farm cooperative organizations. And that's surprising in some respects, but not with uh, one of the ones that uh, have survived, and it's usually on a regional or, or uh, basis, one of the keys, it seems to me, as I look at it, is their ability to control the input market, in other words, the farmer input market, or influence it. And they, they often do become a kind of tough UFA to be able to the hub. Uh, sector specialist co-ops are another dimension of that, and I will think on it. There are, it's, it's a plethora. It's a big swath of Canadian history. Um, and you cannot remove a consideration of federations without looking at underlying rural change. If I was asked to name three or four major changes in Canada in the 20th century, one of them would be rural transition. It's unbelievable what we did in the 20th century without much or protest in it. But it wasn't. In view of the changes that were made, it's remarkable. And there's a whole bunch of aspects of that. The challenges of orderly marketing, uh, I wouldn't want to be a dairy farmer in Quebec. No, I'm not so sure that it's as safe as it once was what was the orderly marketing system. The agricultural consumer dichotomy, which is deeply, there's different dimensions of it, um, but the specific one here uh, that's really important is the con is a competition over who sells what to whom. And in more recent times, the rise of what I call or the increasing of rural individuals. I went home once from Saskatchewan, having spent a month there in 1976. And I told my wife, I want to write a book called That Summer in Saskatchewan. Because what I saw. And I visited all kinds of places I went to, with the project was. Um, I, but I remember the, what I saw. And I saw young people and old people, and they were not of the same kind. Young people were totally different in their expectations uh, and who they were. And you could see you know, visually. 
My wife didn't encourage me to wait. <laughs> okay. Stop. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I always do it in total. So. But uh, you know, there will be more. I, I, I think what this will end up in is three or four papers. Uh, and I welcome your comments on any of this. Uh, oh, I'll do this. Uh, this is one last thing. There I am. There's my email. If you have any comments, advice, nasty criticisms, I'll please send them.